<laughs> okay, I'll continue. I think most of you have managed to achieve that model. You will have found that it typically had a relatively good fit in terms of the, uh, the TFI and the CFI, but didn't do very well in RMCA. Sometimes people relax the norms and say 0 0.08 is also acceptable. It's a little bit like with p-values. You don't want to completely discard something if it's 0 0.06, for example. So it's just to use an intelligent decision or some type of criterion. Okay, so now we can visualize these uh, things. So last time we also might have already dealt a little bit in some plot. And so what we can do is we can make some semi-pretty graphs. Again, they'll look better on your screen than on my screen because of the resolution loss. So in this case, we're using some plot. We take the Lavan object, it will recognize it. We say how we want it to be laid out. We can have a tree or a circle, whatever type of layout. And so here we have a circle representation, and RAM stands for reticular action model, which is just a way in which to represent it. You can pick different styles. In this case, we STD stands for standardized. We want the standardized coefficients on this. So otherwise, we, this one would be one. Remember that we have one as a, as one, and so this rescores everything. So this one also has a value to it. Yeah. And so, but the the things with these type of braces. Uh, with, uh, with these type of breaks, or the ones which were fixed in the model in order to estimate it. But then we can rescore everything to get their coefficients, right? Because it's all just dummy variables. Mm -hmm. And so the brightness of the green will say how good a loading it is. So you wouldn't be able to see it here, but this is 0 0.77 uh, or uh, 0.67, 0.72. So quite good factor loadings because they're above 0 0.7, right? So we can also change this light a little bit more because it's cleaner. So this one still had all the uh, all the all their own little error variances, which made it a little bit messy. And if you take the style which is literal, it only plots for these ones the uh, the, the covariances, not having these additional double things there. And it represents right well, here we would have double-headed arrows, and in literal these are single-headed arrows to represent the remaining error variances. Yeah, so depending on what your supervisor wants, you can make this chart or you make the previous charts. Again, different journals have different preferences on whether it should be a double-headed arrow or a single-headed arrow. So that's why uh, you might have to play around with these a couple of bits to sort of get what you want. So very quickly, I would now like you've built this model to just in one step make this type of model. So you're going to need some plots and to visualize your model. So that shouldn't take you very long. It's just one line of code to make that model. So I'll leave it on here. And I, I don't care if you use the literal one or the other one. So. Everybody managed to do that? Yeah? Then I'm going to move, uh, move along. So the nice thing also is if you have to do this often, you can get this is low resolution, but you can, ex again, export all these graphs. And you'll have nice, pretty pictures summarizing your uh, structural equation models for your papers. Now we can also, and this is a little bit uh, trickier, we can export a table with all the, uh, all the coefficients. <laughs> so here you have a bunch of uh, code. But what we want to do is we make a table from the results table. And so we basically, we take the parameter estimates from the fit object, and we take the standardized coefficients. Yeah. You remember that this little beast is the pipe. So this says, do something else to this. Yeah. So this says, select all the ones which have this symbol in it. Yeah. And then in uh, dplyr select, we're going to select all the ones uh, which have latent, uh, and we're going to rename them in one step. So latent factor, indicator, estimate. And you can see that I used this here because we can't have names with spaces in it. So that's why I used the quotation marks in that step. Yeah. Otherwise, we'd have latent underscore factor. So you can see that I don't have quotation marks here, but it doesn't have spaces in it. So I don't have to use them. Yeah. So it's. That's just relabeling all the column names at that step. 
And then we're going to use our friend Stargazer again. This is something we've done before. We take the data set and we summarize it. And we want to suppress the means and standard deviation. We just want to show that data frame as is in a pretty little output. And we're going to save it as like an HR table. So again, for p-value, I've used the quotation marks to, uh, to make sure that it's, uh, it's printing it correctly. So if we do that, then hopefully we'll get something like this. Oh, it will have opened it in somewhere else. There we go. So we'll have made something like this. So with some very basic data wrangling, now we have the uh, the uh, uh, table with all the coefficients in it. Yeah, we have the beta, which is the standardized coefficients, and the b, as you remember, the unstandardized coefficients, and then the z values and the p values attached to it. So you could beautify it more by, for example, dropping that uh, column. There's other things you could do to it, but this is just basically showing you how to get the pretty little table, and again, a couple of lines of code. Again, if you're using another software package, you would be copying and pasting into Excel, tinkering with all the size of the layout and all the type of boxes and that type of uh, shenanigans in order to get something like this. So especially if you have to make lots of tables for your reports, R can hopefully help you. So hopefully I'm convincing you more and more that if you have to do things over and over, this will be a faster way of doing it. Yeah, because you only once you have the code, you can use it as a workhorse for all type of factor analysis you'll do ever again. Yeah. Any questions? So that was just a step where we made a table. Back to that, back to this. So interpretation. So most of them, if you look at the standardized scores. I won't go uh, back to it in, uh, entirely, but you could see from these type of graphs, most of them, in my example, load above 0.45, uh, so that's quite good. There's some further decision rules which you can uh, uh, which you can read on like whether you should keep an item or not keep an item. And so people use 0 0.4, 0 0.5 as a cutoff values. Other use a range like 0.32 is for, uh, poor, fair, good, very good, excellent. Again, as with these other things like RMCA and p-values, you should be aware that rules of thumb are rules of thumb, and like it's a, it's a gliding scale, so you shouldn't place cutoffs, just arbitrary cutoffs. Yeah. So we can also then check whether we still have some stuff in our trash bag. So we can use cor uh, a correlation plot. So we can get the re uh, residuals. Uh, and what we do, we make a function here, and this will basically take a matrix and turn it into this little plot. This is the type of thing which you've seen before. This is what we've done before. We made a correlation plot, and this just takes something and then makes it into this. So it's an example of a function. You've seen functions when we've done bootstrapping and these other things. So it's just using a little small function to do this for us. And you couldn't see the range, but most of these correlations are below 0.3 in absolute size. So that means good news because it means that there isn't much stuff going on in our trash bag. So if there were like really strong correlations in here, we'd probably have to go back to the model and it would be quite a poor fit. And we try and constrain, and for example, say these items are highly correlated. And so we impose a correlation between, for example, those items by the code you've seen. But here it's all hunky-dory and we don't have to really uh, worry about it too much. Now what we can do is we can make a single factor model. So rather than saying there's three domains for intelligence, in this case, we make one which is called ability, and all of these things load onto this uh, single factor. So for the Holzinger Schweinfurt data, it basically means this very long equation, yeah, where we now have all nine items loading on a single factor. We could call that ability or G if you're into intelligence literature, just saying generalized intelligence captures this all. So we can again build a built a model, uh, we again save the fit measures, and what we can then do is we can compare how much better or worse this model is to the other model. So again we have this text output, and again the versions will be slightly different because I used a different uh, uh, version of this, but you'll again get some output. And you can immediately already tell that it's going to be a poor model likely because the RMCA, you remember that before we had 0 0.07 or something, and now it jumps up to 0.817. So it's definitely not as good a fit as we had before on RMCA, and also not on CFI and TLI. Yeah? So that's already some hints that perhaps the single factor model, where we capture everything out of one factor, 
is a poor fit to the data. Yeah. We can then use, let's see what comes next. We can then use and actually qualify how much better fitting one model is to another one. So it will have printed uh, these AIC and BC things like right here. So here you have an AIC of 738.448. Uh, and here we have 7595. So around more than 200 units or something uh, different. So this one, sorry, AIC. So the rule for AIC is lower is better. In absolute terms, AIC values are not meaningful because they're determined by the model, but you can use them to compare models and say one is better or worse than the other one. And so, and you can quantify how much better or how much worse there is uh, to one to the other. And as a general rule of thumb, if you're comparing models, more than 10 units is already quite a big difference. And you'd say this model is way more supported than this other model. So here we're talking about units of 200. So you definitely say there's a lot more evidence for the three-factor model than there is for the one-factor model. So that was the AIC. The BEC is, uh, so some people are Bayesians. You might have heard of Bayesian statistics. They, for example, assume that more complex models are less likely to happen in reality. So they penalize model complexity more severely because you have to make some assumptions on every single arrow you draw. And so, for example, the AIC is not as punitive for more complex models as compared to simpler models. Bayesians say simpler models tend to be more plausible because you draw less arrows, less assumptions. So they would uh, put in a penalty for com more complex models. And so that's why you have differing values between AIC and BC. It depends on your theory and your rationale behind it on whether you think, for example, uh, you, uh, something is more parsimonious or more likely to happen or less likely to happen. So that's why you have these two, uh, two measures. So if we go back, lower is better for these AICs and BCs. As I've just explained, this BI, a Bayesian information criterion penalizes more complex models more harshly than the AIC. So if you draw more arrows, then the BIC will be harder than the AIC. Yeah. So lower values are better values. The rationale behind this is information theory and entropy, if we go into like all sorts of other things. So we can quantify all these things with probabilities and likelihoods and log likelihoods. And uh, you can read that about that here. And there are many guidelines on, on these fit indices. And again, you can read more here. For now, for example, you should know, and I'll, when we come along further, I'll tell you more about these fit indices. 10 units or more than 10 units difference is a big difference between the two models. And that's also reflected if you just looked at those CFIs and TLIs that the one factor model was a way poorer solution than the three factor model. What you can also do, and you can read more here, is you can run a bunch of models and then you can re-quantify and say, if I was a betting man, how much money should I put on model one? How much model money should I put on model two, model three, model four, model five? To then, for example, spread out uh, your weights across different models. Yeah. So rather than picking the single lowest fitting model, you could say, I have 100 units of confidence, so to speak. And so eight are going to go to that model, 10 are going to go to that model, and another 10 are going to go to that model. Yeah. So it's a different way of thinking. Rather than saying a singular model has to be true, it's saying, if I were to gamble, which model should I uh, cover? So this interpretation from these rules of thumb, again, the most important is more than 10 units different, very strong evidence for one model or the other. Between zero to two, not more than a bare mention. <laughs> again, I love the terminology. Uh, positive or strong, so two to six units is already some type of evidence, and six to 10 strong. And more than 10 people say conclusive or very strong evidence. Yeah. So again, these are cutoffs, and you should apply them sensibly. And again, sometimes you might want to build lots of models and just reweigh all of them because they'll be very close. And then you should report probably all of them. Yeah. So in our case, a model with three factors is a better fit to the data than a model with single factor. And if you go and look, both of them are more than 205 units difference. We can also get this in, like, if you wanted a p-value, you can, because they're likelihood ratio tests, you can get a p-value from using the ANOVA method. So this is the model one, the model two. So this is the lower, uh, the lower fitting one, the, the better fitting one. And you could see how many degrees of difference there are between the models. And then you could see the p-value. So the lower fitting one is the better fitting one than the other one. Yeah. 
So as I've just been hammering on, there's overwhelming uh, evidence for a three-factor solution in this data compared to a one-factor solution. So you remember that for exporter factor analysis, we were using all these rules of thumbs of looking at where the graphs are, and here it's slightly more structured, and we can quantify and say, this model is this much better supported with three factors compared to this model with one factor. Yeah, so that's one of the benefits, and that's why you should know about this stuff. So I would like you to now make a one-factor mo model on your Sudanius data and compare that model to a three-factor model and see what you conclude. So similar as I did, just have one equation with all the things loading onto a single factor and then see how that compares to your other model. <laughs> 